Thank you, President Rooney, for those inspiring remarks. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Nancy Tuckman. I'm the Dean of the Institute of Environmental Sustainability. And it is my pleasure to be able to introduce to you the 2018 freshman convocation speaker and author of our selected first year text, Dr. Andrew J. Hoffman. <laughs> Dr. Hoffman is professor, scholar, author, engineer, businessman, and environmental crusader. He holds the unique and esteemed position of endowed professor of sustainable enterprise, which is an interdisciplinary joint position between the Ross School of Business and the School of Environment and Sustainability at the University of Michigan. He received his PhD from the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, also in an interdepartmental program from both the School of Management and the Department of Civil and Environmental Engineering. Dr. Hoffman has worked in industry and academia, always bridging business with the environment. He's authored many books on the interface of business, culture, and environmental sustainability and enjoys a good reputation of being at the cutting edge of this interdisciplinary challenge. Every year, each of Loyola's first year students read the same book over the summer. This gives the incoming class a common experience and an example of the values and Jesuit mission that we are committed to here at Loyola. How many of you are aware of Loyola's strong commitment to environmental sustainability? Did you know that we're ranked the fifth greenest campus in the United States? <laughs> well, this year's book, called Finding Purpose, Environmental Stewardship as a Personal Calling, is written by a man who has made it his life's work to invite people to think about how we can better steward the environment through our personal practices as well as our business practices. In his book, Finding Purpose, Dr. Hoffman invites us to look beyond material growth and explore the role of the individual and business in discovering a greater good of a balanced and sustainable society. Working at the interface of business and environmental sustainability is a challenging frontier and one, of, one in great need of innovative thought leaders like Dr. Hoffman. We're delighted to have him here to inspire us to do more for our common home. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Andrew J. Hoffman. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, President Rooney, Provost Callahan, thank you so much for the invitation to be here. Dr. Tuckman, thank you so much for that introduction. And I have to thank the faculty and the class of 20, 2022 for being so open-minded as to invite a Michigan Wolverine to address you here today. <laughs> and of all places, the basketball arena. <laughs> I'm quite aware I'm on shaky ground, so I think we can stop talking about that now. Because <laughs> that's not what I'm here to talk to you about. You were assigned my book, and if you didn't read it, I'm about to give you the crib notes. So, pay attention. <laughs> I guess many of you didn't read the book. If there's nothing else you remember from what I'm going to tell you today, I'd like you to remember this quote from Mark Twain. The two most important days of your life are the day you were born and the day you find out why. You had nothing to do with that first day. Your parents made that decision for you. 
you have everything to do with that second day. It is your task, it is your job, it is your quest to find out that reason why you were born. And that's what you are here to do at Loyola. To begin your quest, I'd like you to recalibrate a question you've probably been asked since you were very young. What do you want to be when you grow up? I want to tell you here today that that's the wrong question. The question should be, what were you meant to be when you grew up? That takes you on a totally different path for not just looking for what do you want, but what will give you meaning in your life? What will be your purpose, your vocation, your calling? Many of you are sitting out there right now thinking you know it. Some are not so sure. Some of you have no idea. All of you have an obligation to discern what that purpose is, what that vocation or calling is. And the, I use the word discern deliberately. Um, that is a word you're going to hear at a Jesuit institution. The Jesuits are experts at helping people go through the discernment process. You have a gift here. I encourage you to take advantage of it. Many people don't. There's a quote I love from John F. Kennedy. He says, you can't have the comfort of opinion without the discomfort of thought. And we live in a time right now where many people have thoughts without the or have opinions without the discomfort of trying to get the basis behind it. So in the time that you're here, as the president told you, find ways to take classes in topics you've never explored, challenge to understand what you really believe, engage with people who think differently from you, expand your mind, figure out who you are, look deep inside yourself, for what that calling is. Because modern culture is going to tell you things that are going to lead you astray. It is a myth that is told to you that fancy cars, big houses, and happy Facebook posts are a sign of a well-lived life. That is not true. There is a myth out there that college can be measured by return on investment. That is not true. And many of you have been taught at an early age to start to do things like build a resume. I see students from fifth grade building a resume. Put all the things on it that you've done. What that teaches you is that your life can be summed up on a piece of paper that can be evaluated by somebody else. And that is a horrible lesson to be taught. It is up to you to decide what your life is for and find your way to it. And in all due respect to Joseph Campbell, it is not simply about following your bliss. It is not simply about having fun or being happy. It is about finding meaning. And to find meaning, you have to find something out there in the world to connect to that will get you up out of bed 30 years from now when the headwinds are strong and you feel like the challenge is hopeless. You will keep on doing it because it is your vocation, it is your calling, it is your purpose. It is what Thomas Berry calls the great work. And he writes this, the success or failure of any historic age is the extent to which those living at that time have fulfilled the special role that history has opposed upon them. It is a role given to us beyond any consultation with ourselves. We did not choose. We are chosen by some power beyond ourselves for this historic task. The nobility of our lives, however, depends upon the manner in which we come to understand and fulfill our assigned role. If we were sitting here in 1941 and you have visions about a, a, a career on Wall Street or in medicine or in law, the great work before you is called World War II, and too bad you have to respond to that challenge. And the nobility of that generation was measured by how they responded to that great challenge, that great work. There are many great works out there. To my mind, the great work, the great challenge of our day is around environmental stewardship, how we handle the environment, how we handle our responsibilities in what is many ways a new challenge. Let me ask you the question of climate change in a way you may have never thought about. Do you believe that we as a species have grown to such numbers and our technology to such power that we can alter the global climate? If you answer that question yes, you are affirming your belief in climate change, but you're also affirming a belief in a new reality that we now find ourselves in. Scientists have proposed that we have left the Holocene and we've entered the Anthropocene, the age of humans an age in which humans are now taking control of certain ecosystems on Earth. 
the world's 7.5 billion people are now in charge of certain ecosystems on Earth and a population that will reach 10 billion by 2050. And we don't know what we're doing. Stephen Jay Gould captured it quite nicely. We have become, by the power of a glorious evolutionary accident called intelligence, the stewards of life's continuity on Earth. We did not ask for this role, but we cannot abjure it. We may not be suited to it, but here we are. There's the great work around the environment. What do we do in this brand new reality? I want to add a, an important caveat to Stephen Jay Gould's comment here, because the we in that sentence is not everyone on Earth. The we in that sentence are those of us in the affluent world. Those of us, for example, here in the United States, where we are 5% of the world's population and we use one quarter of its fossil fuels. Or the fact that 80% of the world, or sorry, 16% of the world's population uses 80% of all the resources available. Those kinds of states stat statistics call to mind for me, to those who much is given, much is expected. The responsibility is ours to do something about this challenge before us. And the challenge is great. Scientists have defined nine planetary boundaries. These are boundaries beyond which we should not go if we want to maintain a safe operating system for human and other life forms, and three of them we are crossing. Climate change, we are altering the climate. Nitrogen, we, we produce more fixed nitrogen than natural processes. That goes into farms, it goes into manufacturing, it goes into the rivers, it goes into lakes, it causes algae, algae blooms, it causes dead zones at the mouth of the Mississippi River. Nothing can live at the mouth of the Mississippi River. And we're causing the sixth great extinction, where as much as 50% of today's species could ex be extinct by 2100. These kinds of stats kind of wash over you. And you sort of, it, it just becomes a, a litany, a drumbeat of negative, negativity. Sometimes you need to be woken up by putting it in a different light. And I had it done to me two years ago. I was talking to a research chemist at Pfizer Pharmaceuticals. And he said very matter-of-factly in the conversation, he said, you know, there are measurable levels of ibuprofen in the Mediterranean Sea. My jaw hit the floor, both at the statement and the casualness with, with which he said it. But he went on to say, that does not concern us. Ibuprofen is a relatively benign compound. What does concern us are birth control pills and antidepressants. You take a drug, sometimes your body doesn't even use it. It passes right through, sometimes it uses very little. It enters the treatment system, the treatment system can't handle it. It enters the aquatic ecosystem and it changes the flora and the fauna. In fact, last year, biologists in Seattle were studying salmon in Puget Sound and what did they found? They found Prozac. They found 40 prescription drugs. They even found cocaine within the bodies of salmon that also are ending up on your plates at the restaurants in which you eat. This is the Anthropocene. Welcome to the Anthropocene. Now, the previous generations left you this challenge, and you can resent them for it. But that doesn't mean you can ignore it. You cannot abjure it, as Stephen G. Gould says. You have to respond. The nobility of your generation will be measured by how well you respond to this challenge. And I don't want to leave you on a total downer, which I, I see a lot of glum faces right now. I want to bring you back up to say that there are signs that the change is happening, that this great work has begun. I want to begin with Pope Francis' encyclical letter, Laudato Si, on care for our common home. A lot of people are calling it the climate change encyclical. It is not, in my opinion. In my opinion, it is a statement about a new set of ethics, a new set of morals in the Anthropocene. One thing he says that's critically important in this document, he says the way we've been understanding Genesis for millennia has been wrong. It is not our job to dominate, our na uh, dominate nature. We need to keep and till. We need to steward it. We need to care for it. It is our common home. It was given to us to watch over until the next generation takes it from there. This is an important document for beginning to examine what we are as human beings in the Anthropocene. And importantly, his statement was followed up by similar statements from people from other faith traditions. The challenge before us is to think differently, not just to develop an electric car, but to think differently about what is nature, who are we as humans, and how do the two interact. That is the challenge before us. And if people hear this message from the church, the synagogue, the temple, the mosque, 
It will have a power to drive change far beyond any carbon price, any regulation, any monetary incentive. And this gives me hope. This gives me hope that we will move forward because we really do have to change how we think. We have to move from a thinking about reducing unsustainability, which is everything we've been doing since the 1960s and before, which is about doing less bad, to creating sustainability, do good. It is a fundamentally different way of thinking about approaching the problem. Think about it this way. In Iraq, we stopped a war. That is a fundamentally different process than creating a peace. That is the total mind shift we have to make. Think about it this way. The challenge of climate change is not just about reducing greenhouse gas emissions. It's about going carbon neutral. It's about going carbon negative. And we have no idea how to do it. But we have to figure out how to do it. And there is hope. There is change. There's a wonderful quote from William Gibson. The future is already here. It's just not very evenly distributed. There are signs out there that there are shifts in play. And the beauty is, you young people in the room, you can see them. The older people in the room become blocked by ideas that have come to form our mind and look at the problems as problems where your generation can look at them as opportunities and, and issues to be solved. And that should give you hope and get you really excited. There are changes afoot. Here are a series of market shifts that are in play, that are connected to our culture, that are changing how we think about energy. At the top, should you invest in incandescent light bulb companies? Answer to question number one, the answer is no. Should you be in investing in compact fluorescent light bulb companies? Probably not. Should you be investing in LED companies? Yes, that is the future. They use far less energy, they last significantly longer, but there's a funny cultural shift going on here. How did our generation buy incandescent light bulbs? We buy them by a wattage, by how much energy they use. Well, that doesn't work with an LED light bulb. You have to learn about things like lumens. How much light does it throw? Because that's what we really want. And people are learning how to buy products like light bulbs with a different mindset. The next line below it, on the left, is a standard thermostat. To the right, we have a eco dashboard by General Electric. And right next to that, we have a Nest thermostat. Let me start with a Nest thermostat. How many people have seen a Nest thermostat? OK. This is a device designed by some engineers at Apple. So it's beautiful and it's intuitive. It's a programmable thermostat, nothing special there. It has a motion sensor in it. It knows I'm not home right now, and it will dial the temperature down to a temperature I set it to, I told it to go to, and it will save energy. I will start to come home, and I will open up my iPod, my iPhone, and I will dial the temperature back up. Siemens now has one that focuses on the GPS of your phone. It knows when you're a certain distance from your home, you're moving in the right direction, it will automatically turn the temperature up for you. The Eco Dashboard goes even further. This is developed by General Electric. It gives you a real-time display of your energy and water use. So you know in, in the moment how much you're spending. So class of 2022, you may go home and find mom and dad installed one of these in your house. And you may get up on Saturday morning and take your favorite one-hour shower. And you may come down and find mom and dad sticking next to this device and saying, that shower just cost X. Don't do that again. And you now, now to be able to connect behavior to outcomes and start to manage your energy use. You may go on vacation, shut everything off, and see the house is still drawing power. And you may start to learn about phantom loads. And you'll learn, for example, that that wonderful 60-inch plasma TV you have hanging on the wall it uses more energy turned off than a regular TV uses turned on because you need to keep the plasma warm for the instant on. And people will start to think differently about the appliances in their home. The next, let me go through these really quickly. The next line below, what is a car? Well, we can go from a standard SUV, we can go to a hybrid, we can go to electric. But what is a car? What is an electric car? Is it a car with a computer or is it a computer on wheels? It's actually the second. And now you have New entrants in the auto sector like Apple and Google and Alphabet developing computers on wheels to get you where you need to go so you don't actually have to buy this big hunk of steel that's going to put a dent in your savings. Let me ask it a different way. Is it a car with a battery pack or is there a battery pack on wheels? It's actually the second. And in that picture right there with the Nissan Leaf, in Japan, you can buy a Nissan Leaf and you can buy a transformer. And if you have a power failure, you plug your car into the house and you run your house off the battery pack. And now there is research being done with Toyota, 
One of the problems with wind and solar, as you probably know, is it's intermittent, so utilities need battery storage, sometimes for very short periods of time. So in the future, you'll be able to park your car, you'll be able to plug it into the grid. The utility will pay for the temporary usage of your battery while it's sitting there dormant. And keep in mind that right now, 95% of the car fleet is sitting dormant, doing nothing. That is wasted resources. How can we turn it into useful resources? I can go further. You have a standard coal-fired power plant. I can build a wind farm. I can build a solar array. But a, a wonderful line from Edwin Land, who started the Polaroid Corporation, he said, the first step in having a new idea is to stop having an old idea. This is where you guys are not contaminated with the old ideas. That last picture on the right is a schematic of a train station in Tokyo that is making electricity right now from a source you overlook every day, and that's the footsteps of the thousands of people that pass the train station, and the impact of those feet is creating electricity. One of my students told me that there's a dance club in Stockholm that uses the same technology, and if you slow down on your dancing, the lights start to dim. <laughs> You're connecting the behavior to outcomes. That last line should, it blows my mind, it may blow yours. On the left, we have a standard front-loading washer which are a fairly new technology in this country, only about 10 or 15 years old, and a lot of people resist it because they said it uses less energy, less water, must not clean so good, and they stopped buying them. On the right is a company in the UK that is developing a washing machine that uses no water. It cleans with nylon beads. Let's see how they can get consumer acceptance of a device like that, but that's the shift in culture of thinking about energy. Do you really need water to clean? This is the world you're entering. It's an exciting world, and I'm, I'm excited for you to step into it. I'm often asked, am I optimistic that we'll solve this problem? And I'm, I have a standard response, a quick response. I say, well, I want to explain the difference between optimism and hope. Optimism is looking at the odds, saying they're in our favor. Hope is saying, I don't care what the odds are. I'm going to do something about it. Hope is far more powerful than optimism. David Orr describes hope as a, uh, as a verb with his sleeves rolled up. I really like that idea. I am hopeful, but I'm pessimistic. Why am I hopeful? Because of you. Because of young people who see the challenge and want to grab it and want to solve it and move forward and make the world their own. So in closing, I want to leave you with a challenge. And to make you that challenge, I want to show you or introduce you to my grandmother. My grandmother, Christina Schneider Hoffman, was born in 1899. She died in 1995. When she died, I thought about all the change she saw in her life. She saw the advent of indoor electrification, indoor plumbing. She saw the first automobile, the first flight, man land on the moon, the first computer. She saw all this and more in one lifetime. What will you see in your lifetime? Do a little thought experiment with me right now. If you're male, take the year you were born and add 79. If you're female, take the year you were born and add 81. That is statistically the year you will die. Sorry, guys. Women last longer than men do. What will that world look like? Can you imagine it? Will there be cars out there? I'm willing to bet no. How will this building be powered? What will we be eating? Where will our clothes come from? How will we learn? I'm willing to bet, in fact, I know you cannot imagine that world. I know it. Because if I told my grandmother the world she would die in, she would look at me like I'm a nutcase. No, men aren't going to fly. People aren't going to fly. We're not going to be on the moon. A computer? I remember when Stephen Jobs first announced, I envision a day where there'll be a computer in every house. And er me and everyone in my generation say, what a crazy idea. Who wants a computer in their house? Imagine a, ta a day today without a computer in their house. That's how fast things are changing. And so the world is changing very rapidly. Think about it this way. A baby born today will live into the 22nd century. What will that world be? More importantly, what role do you want to have in making it the world you want it to be? That is your challenge. That is your great work. In the words of Abraham Lincoln, the best way to predict your future is to create it. The nobility of your generation will be defined by how you respond to the great work. Good luck. Thank you very much.